All right, uh, we'll get started. Uh, so first off, I'll, uh, let me just pull up the assignment and uh, I'll take your questions on it. Okay, so recall that it's uh, due a week from now, uh, module of the slip day, uh, which you can use for either assignment one or assignment two, your choice, and uh, that lets you submit it at lunchtime on Friday as opposed to Wednesday. So that will be the same for assignment two. It will be due on a Wednesday, and uh, you can slip till the following Friday if you want. Uh, that's basically it, so just put it in EAS. Uh, when you're done with it, work individually, and yeah, so now that you've had a chance to read it, is there any questions about it? Uh, or is it pretty clear, or, or you haven't read it yet? Okay, so uh, that sounds good. So uh, anyways, uh, I'll just remind you that we don't have class next week uh, because of the whole election day and Thanksgiving Monday. Uh, so if you have questions uh, between now and then, I'll have office hours on Tuesday. Uh, so you can ask uh, during office hours. Okay. All right, so then we'll, uh, we'll jump back uh, into the notes. And so the last thing that we talked about were certificate authorities. So I'll just do a recap. So we were looking at uh, the fact that there's a bunch of root CAs, they come hardwired in your computer, plus there's, you know, maybe a couple hundred intermediary okay and generally it's true there's maybe a few exceptions for like really big companies like Google that you know have a browser and they have a website and things like that but generally if you're Concordia or someone that, that no one knows about uh, any CA can issue a certificate for your site And so you have a kind of weakest link problem that shows up a lot in security, uh, where here's 300 ways of attacking the system. Uh, you can choose the easiest target. OK, now the reason we were looking at root certificates is we, we were trying to answer a question. Let me, uh, I'll just pull the questions up. So we said, you know, I go to Concordia, they give me this certificate, and it says that this is their public key. And if I know for a fact that that's Concordia's public key, then I can do SSL. I can make a tunnel to them, and that's no problem. That's the only real piece of information I need is, is I need to know that this is actually their public key. The problem is I'm asking for their public key over a network where there could be adversaries, and the adversaries could be changing any messages that they want to. So they could change Concordia's asserted public key to be their own public key, right? Then I'll have a tunnel to the adversary, even though in my mind I think it's going all the way to Concordia, it's not, okay? Um, and so that's, that's basically the threat uh, that we face. So we said, well, you're going to solve this problem with certificates, okay? So certificates is going to be a signature saying that yes, this is Concordia's public key. And if the adversary wants to go in and change the public key, they're going to wreck the signature, okay? So they're, they're not, uh, it's the signature is no longer going to be valid, and so I won't accept it. Okay, so that's what's going to, to solve uh, this particular problem. Now, the problem that we had with this, the, the further sort of problems, is two things. One thing is, well, how do I know the CA's public key? Right, because to check that signature, I need to know their public key. And if, if I'm doing this whole process to figure out what Concordia's public key is, then how come I know their public key, but I don't know Concordia's public key? Okay, and so that's what root certificates mean. So root certificates basically say, well, we're going to tell you Apple, I buy my computer from Apple, they're going to tell me the, the 50 
50 companies and their public keys. And it's going to come with my operating system. It's going to be hard coded into the operating system. Okay, so that's enough to at least bootstrap the system. So now I have 50 points, the 50 public keys that I know. And if these companies then issue certificates for other, uh, like for Concordia or whatever, I don't need to know Concordia's public key. I just need to know the CA's public key and then have the CA itself sign off on Concordia's public key, essentially. Okay, so I can trace it somehow back to a root certificate that's on my computer, then, then that's fine. Okay, so there's, there's millions of sites on the internet. They change every day. So it's not feasible to put everyone's public key into a computer. That's basically the argument, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to pick 50 organizations. They're going to be in the business of issuing these certificates. We'll put their keys in the computer and then we'll give you this kind of chaining protocol where you can chain back to one of these certificate authorities and then, and then that's how we'll get the system to work, okay? Now the second problem that we haven't answered is, okay, so now I don't, like Concordia says this is my public key. I'm like, I don't know if that's true or not. There may be an adversary switched it out. Now it's signed by VeriSign and VeriSign the company saying, well, well, we checked and this is actually Concordia's public key. I know VeriSign's public key because it came with my computer, okay? But the remaining question is, well, how did VeriSign figure out what Concordia's public key was? right? Because somehow they were able to figure it out. And VeriSign doesn't know, they don't know Concordia necessarily. Okay, so, so basically, how were they able to figure it out? How were they able to solve the problem that I want to solve? Right? And what's special about VeriSign so that they can solve this problem of figuring out what Concordia's public key is, and I can't? Right? Because whatever method they use, I could just use it myself, then I wouldn't need VeriSign to say it. I would, I would just go and check Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the, the last remaining issue, so we'll, we'll talk about that now. So this is issue two in that list. So how does the CA decide on a website's actual public key? And then the, the question you can ask sort of in the back of your mind is why, why can't I do the same thing? Okay, why can't users just follow the same process if we can solve this problem? And if they, if they could, then you don't need CAs at all. They just, they just directly verify uh, the public key. Okay, so how does, how does the CA, like so Concordia.ca have a certificate. Uh, it's from an actual CA, let's take a look at it. No, you might have different certificates for different subdomains. So they're, they're tied to a subdomain. Um, but, but generally, a website's going to get uh, what's called a wildcard certificate. So they'll get a certificate for star.concordia.ca, and that will let them use that certificate on any, uh, any subdomain of concordia.ca. Um, although this certificate is actually specific uh, for Moodle uh, as opposed to, to anything else. But anyways, uh, there's a company called GlobalSign. So they sign this certificate. Okay, so somehow Global Sign figured out that uh, the key that's sitting in the certificate, uh, which is here, or at least they truncate it, but uh, this is the key that Concordia saying is their public key, and somehow Global Sign, the company, was able to say yes, that is Concordia's public key. So how did Global Sign do it? Does anyone have a guess, or or maybe no, because they've gone through the process? Okay, so they'll, they'll go to, over to Global Sign and say, I want to buy a certificate. It usually costs money. Uh, they'll say, this is my public key. Now, the problem is I could also go to the website and say, I'm Concordia. This is my public key. So the website still has to figure out, is this Concordia that's asking for it? Or is it some person impersonating Concordia asking for it? 
so how does how does the website distinguish? How does it figure out that it's not someone impersonating Concordia? Okay, so that's true. So, so if you have a certificate already issued, you could restrict if you're allowed to ask for other certificates. The problem is that CAs generally don't check that. So uh, if someone came to a different CA and said, I'm Concordia.ca, they're not going to say, oh, does Concordia already have a certificate or who's their current CA? And the reason is because CAs compete on price. So it, it might actually be Concordia coming the second time and they just want to switch CAs because it's cheaper or something like that. So it's not reliable that, that every time you see a CA switch that it's necessarily an attack. It could be like, so there was a browser extension that you could get that would warn you anytime the CA changed for a website. Uh, and, but yeah, but there, there, there are both legitimate and illegitimate reasons. So you can't, you can't be 100% certain by seeing that. Any other guesses? Okay, so the answer is that there's two main ways of doing it. Um, and the end result of your certificate is actually different. So there's two kinds of certificates that you can get, sort of a high quality certificate that uses one process and a lower quality certificate that uses a different process. So the high quality certificate is that they, um, they actually do like in-person invalidation. Validation. So there's, there's a human being uh, that's at the CA. And someone from Concordia would come and they would have some documentation, maybe a, a letter that was signed by the dean or they would have an employee ID or something like that. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be in person. It could be over email or phone or something like that. But, um, you know, the CA might call Concordia's IT desk and then, you know, talk to someone or something like that. Okay. So there's some sort of in-person validation. Um, so it could be by... Mail, you could document it, uh, email, phone. So when I say in person, it's more like there's a human in the loop. It doesn't strictly have to be that you walk into an office and, and talk to the person. Um, and you provide them with some business documentation that's, that's convincing enough. Okay, and if you go through this process and you get a certificate out the other end, uh, we call it an extended validated certificate. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to bind three, there's a whole bunch of stuff in a certificate, but there's three critical pieces of information. So you're going to have the public key You're going to have the company uh, or organization or person or whoever. And EV certificates, uh, for, for most CAs, I think all CAs, they're limited to, actually they're limited to businesses that have a registered business name in a specific country. So like it, it, not every country, but like if you're in Canada, for example, you would have a government registered business name and uh, then you, you could have that put in the certificate. Okay, so it would be like, you know, business ink or whatever. And there's a whole legal process to get this name and it can't be the same as anyone else's name. And you can't even have names that are like, could be confused easily for other businesses names. And, and there's things like that, that sort of protect that process. Okay, so you have a registered business name. And then you have the domain of, of your company. So business.ca or whatever. Okay, now EV certificates, when I first started teaching this course, you could actually tell that you were on a website that had one of these EV certificates, uh, but 
all of those features have been now discontinued because basically everyone, no one knew what they meant, and so everyone ignored them anyways. Um, but it, anyways, so historically, uh, the color green would be used. So either the lock would be green, or the domain name would be green, or um, yeah, so, so green uh, visual cue. And often they would display the business name as opposed to the domain name. So if you went to Twitter, it would have like the lock icon. There might be some green Chrome around it, and it might say Twitter Inc. or something like that. And so that's telling you, oh, I'm connected to Twitter, the company that's registered in the United States. Okay, this is their website. Okay, but now if you go to an EV or a DV, they, they, what's called DV is going to be the other type of certificate. They all look the same. Um, so people didn't know like, oh, this is green, so I, I should treat it differently than if it weren't green. Uh, it was just kind of lost on users. Okay, so this works fine. The only problem with it is it's not really scalable, right? If you have 2 million websites trying to get these certificates from 50 companies or whatever, uh, it's still like a lot of work for the companies. Uh, and then it takes a lot of time too. So it could take days or weeks uh, to get your certificate issued. Uh, what happens a lot is that certificates come with an expiration date, so they don't last forever. Uh, and if they expire, people don't always remember to renew them ahead of time. So like what will happen is you'll start getting emails saying, hey, I can't access your website. You'll go investigate and you'll be like, oh yeah, my certificate expired, I totally forgot about it. Now you have to renew your certificate, right? And if you have to do this process, then you're not gonna get a new certificate for days or weeks. And so what are you gonna do in the meantime? Right, either you gotta turn off HTTPS or just users can't use your website for a couple days. And if you're an e-commerce site and you're selling things, I mean, that's, that's a huge deal, right? Yeah, it's millions of dollars that you could lose or whatever. Um, so we don't want this. Okay, so what would be nice is if there were a kind of fully automated way where you could get a certificate that didn't have to involve a human looking at documentation and things like that. Okay, so what CAs offer, the second thing they offer is a, a fully automated process. So there's no humans, just a server. Uh, and you're going to try and convince the server uh, that, that you are basically concordia.ca. Okay, we'll, we'll talk in a second about how you do that convincing. Um, but. So I'll just say there's some process that you follow. We'll, we'll talk about that next. Uh, the end result is what we call a DV certificate. So it's kind of like a normal certificate. And a DV certificate is not going to try and figure out, is this Google.inc that I'm talking to? Okay, Because it's basically impossible for a computer to do that in an automated way. Uh, maybe like with visual learning or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's some way of doing it. but. Uh, it's, it's really hard to figure it out, okay? So what they'll do, though, is they could figure out possibly that, you know, it's at least business.ca. The, the computer that's responding to, you know, if I type in business.ca, I end up on some server, and that server is the same server that's asking for this certificate, okay? If I can figure that out, and there's a potential that I could do that in an automated way, then I could at least bind that public key to that server, right? So like, for example, the server could just put the public key up on the server and say, this is my public key. The only problem with that is there might be an adversary in the middle, right? Um, so, so you have to take that into account. But, but that's the sort of thinking uh, that you could use, okay? So a DV certificate is going to just bind a public key and a domain. Uh, this stands for domain validated. 
because it only validates the domain. And this, I guess I didn't write it, but it's extended validated because it extends validation beyond the domain. Uh, Okay, now because they are not going to try and get the business, you don't necessarily, like say I'm trying to go to Google the company in Mountain View, right? I have to know that their domain is google.com, right? Uh, if I know it's google.com, then I, when I go to google.com, I'll get a certificate and that will be valid for google.com, okay? But I had to make that link in my mind. So for example, if I go to Google with three O's, right? That's not Google the company in Mountain View, but that's a website that could actually have a certificate because they just have to prove that they control Google with three O's.com. So the certificate isn't saying, oh, this is Google the company. It's just saying that this is the public key for the domain name that you're typing in, okay? But if the domain name that you're typing in is wrong, then, then the public key's wrong as well, right? Um, so, so that's why they're, they're sort of limited. Historically, the, the vision of HTTPS was that you would just do EV certificates. Okay, that, that was originally uh, the, the way that people envisioned, but it wasn't regulated. There was no regulation of it. And so companies, uh, certificate authorities basically just started doing this. And there was no one to say, don't do it that way. And then over time, because this is cheaper and users like it better too because it's faster and things like that, it became the kind of prominent way then security people came along and said, oh, that, that, I'll show you why, but like, you probably shouldn't do it that way. It's, it's, not, it's not that great uh, in terms of security. And so then they went back and they said, okay, well, let's have these EV certificates and, uh, and we'll, we'll try and bring back like certificates, but now we'll have two tiers. We'll have like the bad certificate and the good certificate. But then users couldn't tell the difference between them. And so now we're just left with certificates and no one really knows whether they're EV certificates or DV certificates. Okay, uh, so let's let's think about uh, attacks on the process. Well, we'll think about the process itself and and the attacks. Okay, so for EV certificates, there's not much you can do other than some sophisticated impersonation attack. So I could say, hey, I, I, I'm a, you know, I work at Concordia, and this is a, my public key for Concordia, and, and try and trick the CA into issuing it. So these kinds of really sophisticated impersonation attacks we call social engineering. Uh, we'll do two, one or two lectures on social engineering itself later in the course. So I won't say more about it now, uh, but basically the idea is that you're going to try and trick uh, the TA the CA, sorry, into thinking that you work for the company. So just let me add to the CA here. So you're impersonating it to the CA. And historically this has happened. Um, so there was uh, one for Microsoft. Uh, and in this case, it uh, wasn't an SSL certificate, but it was for signing code. So it's the same principle. Uh, if you have, like, say you download something from an app store, you want to know it comes from the, you know, from Microsoft, the company. Uh, you use certificates, they're used in the exact same way. You have root certificates and things like that. Uh, it's just used for signing code as opposed to signing messages, traffic to and from a website. Um, so you could imagine it happening for HTTPS, but in this case it happened to be a coding uh, certificate, code signing. And the person that, that did the attack, um, so they, they basically impersonated working for Microsoft when they didn't. And in this case, they, they did actually work for Microsoft in the past, okay? So it wasn't like some completely random person who showed up and pretended to work at Microsoft. They were an ex-employee, they were fired, they were mad about it, and then they did this kind of as, as an attack against the company. So presumably they, they still had maybe some of their badges or, or 
um, identification or things like that. And uh, they certainly knew a lot. They knew the right things to say and things like that. Okay, now DV certificates. Okay, so the first thing is that it doesn't help with phishing. Or look-alike domains. You know, so I, I don't know if this is a real domain or not. I would be scared to type it into my computer, but something like this. Maybe goggle.com, that kind of thing, okay? So you can get certificates for this, okay? So if you go to a site like this and you see the lock, doesn't mean that it's Google the company. You can get an EV certificate like this, at least one that would display Google Inc. Uh, but you could get a DV certificate because the person that asked for the certificate actually controls that domain. Basically, the domain matches what's in the certificate, so it's, it's all fine. Okay, so now let's, before we think of more attacks, let's think about, let's look at the process itself. So how do I do domain validation uh, if I'm a CA? And there's three main ways of doing it. Uh, I can do it through email. I can do it through what's DNS, or I can do it through uh, the, the website itself. And these are all kind of more or less the same. And you'll see that they kind of reduce to the same set of problems. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about the first one, uh, the email example. OK, so this is what happens. Uh, you have a user and you have a CA. And usually you do this interaction through the website. So you fire up your favorite CA and you scroll to the page, you find the certificate that you want and you agree to pay the price or whatever it is. Uh, and then now it's time to validate that you are who you are, who you say you are. So you say, I am domain.ca, so that's all you're saying. You're not saying I'm some company or anything like that. You're just saying I'm the person that controls domain.ca, okay? And this is my public key. And in technical terms, this is called a CRS, Certificate Request, uh, but you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So this is for email validation. Okay, so the user submits the request. And the CA says, okay, you, you claim to, to uh, control domain.ca. I'm going to test whether you actually do or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send email to an address at domain.ca and I'm going to put a secret like a number or code or something like that in that email. And if you can come back to me and tell me that exact same secret, uh, then that's fine. Then I'll believe that you must be able to answer emails at domain.ca and because you can answer emails at domain.ca, you must be domain.ca. Okay, so that's kind of the, the logic of it. So the CA will choose a secret. So 
So some number value. Let's call it a number. And it could be baked into a link, like just click on this link and then in the URL of the link is the, is the number or whatever. And so this CA emails X to the domain. And we'll, we'll come back to this point, but it, it has to pick a, a username at domain.ca. Uh, so by default, uh, one, the most common one is it will email a min at whatever website you're claiming to be. Okay. And then the user, you know, they either fetch the X and copy it into the website or they click on the link or whatever, but basically somehow they relay back to the CA that, that I know X. And then the CA will say, okay, you convinced me. Now I'm going to sign a certificate with your domain name and your public key. So the CA uh, issues the certificate. Issues and signs are, I'm sort of using interchangeably. And then the user can download it or they email it to them or, or whatever. Okay, so this is the process. Uh, it's fully automated uh, The CA from the CA's perspective. The, the human user has to go in their email and click on it, uh, but the CA can just, you know, they just run a server and it just automatically does this stuff. So there's no delay from the perspective of the CA themselves. Now, uh, okay, so what, what do you think of this process? Is this uh, more or less trustworthy uh, or are there some areas where maybe there might be attacks. Like if you want to remember, we're ultimately building an attack tree. Okay, so this is the process. This is the defense against someone who wants to get a fake certificate and impersonate a website. So I'm an attacker, that's what I want. I want a fake certificate, so I want to find some attack in this process. So, so what, what, what exactly am I going to impersonate? Okay, good. So what does that mean now, impersonate admin at domain.ca? So basically, um, you're saying that I'm going in this domain and uh, then the security is going to be returned that security, but you're not actually the domain.ca. And uh, so that it will be valid for security. Okay, so I'm getting the certificate because I have access to that email account. So why? What is some circumstance where I would have access to that email account if I wasn't domain.ca? Uh, so maybe like let's say you're an architect and I'm uh, as an example, so you might have access to those. Okay. Email. All right. So let's put attacks here. So let's call that an insider attack, it, even though an ex employee is kind of a, an outsider. Uh, but we could have an insider attack where. The attacker is someone that's at the organization, basically, that has, they have access. To admin at domain.ca. They can fetch, they can fetch the thing out, X out, return it, and then they can get a certificate. Sure. So, yeah. So, insider attack will consider that as well. So, someone who has access, either they themselves are the attacker or they're being coerced uh, by someone else uh, in order to do the attack. So, you could definitely go in the organization, try and coerce someone in IT that has access to it. Then you could get the certificate. So, just sticking with this theme, how else, how else could I get this email address? Is there any other way? Why can't I just log into this email address? So what stops me? Okay, I hear murmurs. Someone say something loud and clear. Why, why can't I just, you know, I, I'm not, this is a google.com. Why can't, can you just go and access admin at google.com? 
or admin at concordia.ca. Why can't you just log into that email address? Okay, so there's a password basically on it, okay? Uh, are there ways to seal passwords? Yes. Sure, how can you seal a password? Guess it, malware, keystroke logger, look over someone's shoulder while they're typing it in. Okay, so. Um, Just guessing, right? Maybe the password database leaks, something like that. You could use social engineering, right, as well. Um, okay. Say louder. Uh, yeah, sure. Sniffing. Uh, I, okay, let's pick up on sniffing. That's actually an interesting one. Um, so the user types the password in on my computer. It goes to the mail server, right? Is that password itself transmitted uh, in clear text or is it encrypted? Okay, it will be it will be hashed on the server, so it's still going to be in plain text. But do I have like an HTTPS connection to my mail server when I type passwords in? So is my authentication to email? encrypted or not? So the answer is generally it is encrypted. Okay, so uh, normally we'd use a protocol like SMTP, and the S stands for secure, secure MTP, uh, or we'd use IMAP. IMAP has, uh, uh, I, I misspoke, sorry. SMTP is not used for that purpose. Uh, for the purpose I'm describing, it's either IMAP or it's POP3. Uh, both of those have encryption available to you, whether you configure or not depends, but most mail servers today are, are, are going to have it configured, okay? Um, so sniffing the authentication won't work. So you're, you know, you, you have POP3, your IMAP's the most common one, and that is an encrypted channel. But going back to SMTP, uh, so that's the protocol that's meant to, to actually transmit the email. Okay, so the email is going to leave the CA server, so they have an email client, right? And it's going to leave it, and it's going to go across the internet to the mail server of domain.ca. And then remember that secret X is in the email, right? So if I were able to intercept the email itself as it was transmitted, then I could read that X value out, okay? So we use SMTP as the protocol to, um, to transmit it. Is that encrypted or not? So put another way, just forget about CAs. I send an email to you. Can everyone that's between my computer and your computer read that email? Or is it encrypted? Okay, who thinks encrypted? Be brave, be brave. Who thinks not encrypted? And if you didn't put your hand up, minus 5% on your mark. No, just kidding. Okay, so you would think that email would be encrypted, right? We got to have figured this encryption thing out. It's been 35 years. You might be surprised to learn that email is not encrypted, okay? It is, there is what we call link encryption. So uh, from one hop, like say the, the server to like the next hop, there will be some encryption just on that link, but then it will be fully decrypted by that server and then it will be forwarded to the next server over an encrypted link. So in other words, if you're one of the servers that's in the middle, then it, you can decrypt the whole thing and you can read it, okay? Uh, this is why you might have heard of PGP. Uh, so PGP is a, an alternative email uh, that provides what we call end-to-end -end encryption. So this is, it's encrypted at the sender and then it's not decrypted until the recipient receives it. Uh, in corporate environments, you have S-MIME. S-MIME's the same thing, it's encrypted uh, at the at the sender and it's not encrypted to the until the receiver receives it. Okay. Now, why don't people use PGP and SMIME? 
The answer is actually the exact same problem that we're trying to solve here. It's really hard for me to know what your public key is. Okay, and I can't ask for it on a, an unencrypted channel because then the adversary can just lie and substitute your public key for someone else. Okay, so in SMIME, you have certificates and all of that type of thing, but now it's not like companies are going to gain certificates. The, the vision is that end users, like you and me would have to go and get a certificate and you can do it. Uh, you can get an SMIME certificate if you want, uh, but, but most users don't wanna pay or go through the hassle of it and then have to renew it every couple of years and things like that. Okay, so certificates kind of work at the company level. They don't really work so well at the user level. And so basically nobody, like I bet nobody in this room has an SMIME certificate. I don't even have one myself, right? Uh, unless if you work for a company where they issued you one, uh, you basically don't have it, okay? So it, it, it's, and same with PGP. Maybe there's a few people uh, that use PGP or have experimented with it, uh, but generally it's sort of fallen out of favor, all right? So uh, the third thing is you could, instead of sniffing me putting the password in, I could sniff the, the transmission of the email itself. Then I could actually read it. So this happens over something called SMTP. And despite the S being secure, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, so it, it just has what's called link encryption. So the adversary would have to be at one of those, the special servers that, that is able to decrypt it in the middle. They, there, there would be places where the adversary could be that they wouldn't be able to decrypt it. So I, like link to link, to link encryption is strictly better uh, than end to end, uh, then sorry, then no encryption at all, but it's still not, it's not end to end encryption. Okay, so you have link to link, which means it can be decrypted by, you know, mail forwarders, mail servers, that type of thing. And then the other problem is we keep going around in circles, but if I want to do link-to-link -link encryption with another server, I need to know their public key, right? And so we have that same problem. So I'm trying to solve that problem for certificates for websites, but if in solving that, I'm assuming that, oh, we do have certificates for mail servers, right? That's not a very good solution, right? So uh, it's, it's a circular dependence, right? Like we, we, can solve, we can solve this certificate public key problem if we just have certificate public keys and we know what they are in this other domain, okay? But we don't have them, okay? So email is subject to the exact same thing, uh, which is that you don't, you don't know anyone's public key. You can ask for them and then it could be, you could be lied to, okay? So what email does is they also do what's called, we mentioned it in the first class, uh, they, they, they uh, implement a protocol that's called uh, trust on first use. Tofu. Or uh, this alternatively is sometimes called optimistic encryption. And what it means is the very first time, I'm a mail server and I don't know the other mail server's key. I just ask for it. What's your public key? They tell me, they tell me in clear text. If there's an adversary on the line, they could replace it with their key and I'm gonna believe the adversary, okay? But if the adversary isn't there the very first time, once I learn the public key, I'm gonna remember it forever. Usually not forever, there'll be some expiration, but it's going to stick, okay? So if the adversary comes down later and says, oh no, actually that's not my public key, it's this other value, I'll say, no, I don't believe you, okay? So that's called opportunistic encryption where you just, you, you ask for someone's public key, you cross your fingers hoping that, they, that you're not being lied to, and then you remember what they told you and you don't, uh, yeah, you don't deviate it from the future, okay? So SSH is another protocol that runs that way. So if you've ever SSH into a computer, it'll be like, here's their public key, what they're saying, do you trust it or not? And if you say yes, then you store it on your computer and then it won't show you that screen ever again unless if the key changes. If the key changes, then it will say, oh, you know, you, you trusted this last, this key like a month ago when you logged into the server, now it's something completely new. Maybe there's an impersonation attack uh, that's happening. 
Okay, another thing we might try and do is guess x. So they, they send a number. I don't know what it is, so I just try 0, 0, 0. It doesn't work. I try 0, 0, 1. I try 0, 0, 2. Um, so anyways, generally this won't work. Uh, so the CA will, will choose something that's... That's long enough with enough entropy. Long random enough that you can't exhaustively search it. But it could be an attack. Maybe you find a CA that, that sends you a four-digit pin or something like that. And, and remember, it just has to be one of those you know, 600 CAs. right? You just find the one that's doing this process with a four-digit pin. And then you're like, OK, that's the one I'm going to attack. OK, what about um, uh, uh, okay for a domain like gmail.com, okay, is it possible that someone at Google, so, sorry, someone that's not at Google, someone other than the people at Google could have an email like admin at gmail.com? Why not? OK, OK. So, First off, with webmail, any user can register any domain. Well, most you can register almost any domain or any uh, username that you want. Okay, so there are websites that purposely give out email addresses for other people. All right, um, so that's fine. So just because someone can answer email at a domain like at gmail.com doesn't mean that they work at Google. Okay, so that's an assumption you can't make. Now the assumption that's implicit here is that everybody in the world knows that a min is not, you know, it's a special email and you shouldn't just hand it out to any users. You need to save that for your IT staff, okay? So first off, you might have companies that don't know that, right? And if they don't know it, uh, then they might hand that out. And you might say, well, well, how, how would a company not know it? Well, the first thing is, what, what language is a min in? It's in English, right? So imagine all the companies in the world, lots of companies, you know, with, they don't know English at all. Right, they never interact in English, right? They might not know. They might not even type out characters in Western characters, right? Are they going to know that they have to reserve admin at a domain? Maybe not. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second thing is, uh, uh, how did the CAs choose admin? Okay, how how did admin become like that reserved kind of email? And the answer is, is the CAs kind of made it up. Like there's no kind of history to it. It just sort of became a thing. And then the question is, well, is there any other, is there any other uh, domain names like that? Like is admin the only one in every, all 600 CAs and all the 2 million websites, they all use admin at email? Or you know, maybe in other countries, other languages, there's some other uh, registered domain names that you could use or, or reserved domain names that should be reserved uh, that you should use, okay? And once again, you only have to find one CA out of, you know, the hundreds of CAs that will, will send that email to something other than a min at domain.ca. And then if you could register that uh, email address, then you could basically get a certificate issued uh, for that particular website. Okay. So uh, let, me, let me just try and capture some of this. So... Is supposed... Reserved. Okay, so one attack is that uh, basically a company doesn't reserve it. They don't know to reserve it. They hand it out to one of the users. And the other attack is that a CA uses a different, so the company knows about admin and they're holding on to that email account, but there's some other email account 
uh, that, that, that the CA uses. So the CA uses a different uh, email account. And the truth is that, that, that there are a bunch of other things like a min. So for example, some CAs will send it to host name. Uh, there was one that would send it to SSL certificates. And so somebody uh, who noticed this, this SSL certificate, they went over to uh, Microsoft Live uh, and they registered SSL certificates at live.ca, like live.com. Used to be Hotmail, now it's, I, my understanding, I don't, haven't used Microsoft in a while, but I think it's live.com. So they were able to register that because it's not that Microsoft aren't a smart company, they're smart. Right, they, they, they actually are making operating systems that have certificates baked in, right? They're as deep into this whole CA thing as any company in the world. But who was weird in this case was the CA, right? The CA was weird because they were sending emails to SSL certificate at your, SSL certificates at your domain.com, right? And they would send it to you. And if you could answer that email, uh, then they would sign off. And their certificate is as good as anyone else's. Doesn't matter if there's some obscure CA that no one's heard of, your browser doesn't care, it's going to show you the lock. As long as it can trace it back to a root, it doesn't care whether it's a big CA like VeriSign or some small CA that no one's heard of, okay? Um, and so someone was able to register and get a certificate And you might say, well, big deal. You, you can only get a certificate for, like say you did this on Gmail, you could get a certificate for gmail.com. But that lets you intercept everyone's email, right? Everyone who's talking to Gmail, you're on the wire between them. Now you can read their emails. Okay, so that's pretty powerful. You can't use it to attack Hotmail or attack Twitter or Facebook, right? Uh, so so you, you could only use it to attack uh, the server that, that uh, you're, you're getting the certificate for. Um, so it's not a general, it's not like a hacking a CA where you could issue a certificate for any website, okay? Um, but in Microsoft's case, live.com was a, a top level domain that was used for lots of other stuff, right? So you had your email, you might have code signing that ultimately happens under something.live.com. You could have all their gaming stuff, you know, that, that could be under live.com. Um, and so that, that could be a very powerful certificate to have that would let you do a lot more than just attack uh, different email or different users' emails. Okay, uh, one more attack. Uh, so let's go back here and let's just walk through this one more time, but we'll go a little bit slower. Okay, so the user shows up, they're on the website. Okay, so they're talking HTTPS, whatever, uh, to the CA. Uh, they put in their domain and they say, this is my public key. CA chooses a secret number X. The email, the CA sends an email to admin at domain.ca. So let's pause here. How does, how does the email go from the CA to admin at domain.ca? Like how, how does email work? Like how does it find its way to the right inbox? Okay, so the first thing you have to do is you have to find an IP address, okay? So where are you going to find the IP address? DNS, DNS okay? So you're going to go to DNS and you're going to say, um, I want uh, the, the, basically I want the mail server for domain.ca. So you'll look up domain.ca and generally a DNS record will have a bunch of different records. So they'll have like something like an A record that will tell you the website uh, so this is the IP address if you want to go visit the website. And then they'll have something called the MX record, which is the mail exchange server, okay? And that's the IP. And so the server that, you know, that holds the website and the server that's handling email, they might be different machines at different IP addresses, okay? Um, so that's not only is it possible, it's actually quite common. Uh, but, but anyways, you're going you're gonna to get the IP address out of the mail server.
Now, let's say in theory, I don't know how, but somehow the attacker is able to put their IP address in for domain.ca's mail server, their MX record, instead of the real one. Then what happens? Then the email finds its way to the adversary. Is it encrypted? No, nope. nope. it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. Could the adversary then read that X value and put it back to the website? Yes, absolutely, okay? So if you could compromise DNS, then you could also compromise this whole domain validation uh, process, okay? So what would it take to compromise DNS? So uh, why can't I just go to you know, the DNS record for google.com and say that the mail server is my IP address? Why can't I just go in and change that? How does the DNS know that, oh, this is Google coming and they're asking for it, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let them change it, but I'm not gonna let you change it because you're, you're not Google. Okay, so it actually just comes down to passwords. Now the question is whose password? How did the, the domain figure out, oh, this is Google? Like when Google registered the password in the first place, how did they determine that, oh, this is Google and I should let them have access to this DNS record as opposed to anyone else? So the answer is that someone had to register the domain in the first place. Okay, so somebody in, at the start of Google went over to DNS, they said, is google.com available? DNS said, yes, it's available. And they said, okay, I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna create a username password and that's gonna protect it, okay? Now I can change my password over the years. I can even switch DNS, uh, like sort of uh, my registrar. I can move my domain from one registrar to another, but I have to like, that process involves authenticating on both sides, okay? So there's gonna be some custody over the domain. So the domain doesn't know that, you know, if, if I'm the domain registrar for google.com, I don't know that I'm dealing with google.com. Google, the company in Mountain View, I have no idea. All I know is that I'm dealing with the same person that registered the domain, okay? That's, that's basically all I care about, okay? Um, so what you could do is you could do any attack on the password, uh, the domain name registrar, uh, password, the registrar's password. Uh, the account at the registrar for domain.ca is what I should say. And you can use any of the attacks that we showed before when you're attacking a min at like the email address keystroke logging, malware, shoulder surfing, just guessing, uh, whatever the case may be. Okay, you could do some sort of social engineering at the domain registrar. So this has happened a lot, actually. Uh, we'll come back when we, I'll give you a specific example um, but let's just pause and say that if you're able to take over someone's DNS record, right, it, it may seem like a small piece of the overall infrastructure, but it's actually very powerful because you completely control their website. You can be issued a certificate, right, because you control their email. So you control the website, you control their email. Every email sent to every person at that company is now coming to you right? You can go out and get a new certificate for the website because the certificate authority will email you at that domain, okay? And so, you know, taking over someone's domain is, is sort of like taking over their digital identity in a sense, okay? So it's, it's very, very powerful. Um, there's other DNS level attacks that I won't cover. Um, so you could try to poison the DNS. You also, like, Let's say the CA asks for the DNS record. I think we covered this earlier, but does that happen over HTTPS? Is that secure or not? So the answer is more or less no. Uh, so if you ask for DNS records, they come to you not encrypted. So if the adversary's on the middle, they can just swap out the IP address in the domain name. Now there is a protocol called DNSSEC that's adding signatures to DNS records. It also has this whole problem of how do you know that the DNS registers public key is their public key and they have certificate authorities. It's a little cleaner because there's only two root certificates in the world for the DNS side of things. Um, DNSSEC is problematic because the, the, uh, the, re the responses that you get are huge. 
So normally, like a DNS record is really small. Like it just has three or four IP addresses and that's it. Now you have some signatures on top, but then different authorities, you have a bunch of authorities that are, are authoritative over different parts of the domain. So like one authority is authoritative over all .coms, and then another authority will be the sub authority for anything .google.com, and then mail.google.com would have its own authority or whatever. And so you get signature on signature on signature, and then it's all signed by the root certificate. And so anyway, the, the thing blows up. Uh, the size of the thing blows up, and then you're hitting DNS all the time, right? You go to Wikipedia, well, that's maybe a bad example, but you go to some website and it's pulling down images from 50 other websites. So you're going to hit DNS 51 times just to load that one page, right? And, and you're doing that every single time you navigate around the web. And so anyways, you know, taking the size of DNS responses and blowing them up by 10 is, it actually ends up being a big deal because it's such a, a widely used protocol. Um, and then there's ways of like trying to poison. So people don't always have like your resolver for the CA they might not have the current information or they're getting information about DNS records by asking other people and maybe you can you know, do impersonation attacks there. Anyways, attacking DNS is its own thing. There's, there's lots of, you can look at it in a project or something like that if you wanna look at all the different kinds of ways of attacking DNS itself. But any attack that lets you change the MX record uh, works. Okay, so this is more or less the attacks that I could think of. There might be a few more, okay? Um, but the, the main takeaway from it is, you know, the, the whole reason that we're doing this certificates and stuff like that is we're trying to get away from, you know, like we're using real cryptography, we're using cryptographic keys, we have digital signatures. We're trying to get away from passwords and all the like kind of weak aspects of, uh, of security or sorry, of, of like network communication. But the end result is that if you could crack the right password, right, or seal it, then you can completely subvert all of this crypto that we're doing, right? You can get a certificate, then you can get the tunnel ending it at you, and then it doesn't matter all the fancy crypto that's being used in SSL, it just does not matter at the end of the day, okay? Um, so the whole model of web security really comes down to things like is are you sure that like that person logging into DNS registrar is that actual person, right? If you can't be sure about that, then you can't be sure about anything uh, in terms of certificates or this whole infrastructure. Okay, so you know emails that are sent unencrypted, usernames, passwords, impersonation attacks. You know all of these things work if you can target it at the right uh, place. Then you can completely subvert this whole certificates and stuff like that. Okay, uh, there's a few other methods that are used uh, instead of email, but they basically come down to the same thing. So what the user will do is, uh, instead of saying, send me an email, what they could do is they could actually just put their public key or their certificate request uh, in the DNS, since it's DNS is so, uh, uh, is so important. And then the CA just looks up. Domain.ca and then they, they pull, if they see the right key sitting there, uh, then it's fine. Or they sign the certificate for the key that they see that's sitting there, okay? Now, this kind of ends up being sort of the same thing. There's a few, this is, there's a less of an attack surface in this protocol uh, because you don't have the whole email that's being involved, okay? So any, if you can attack DNS, you can attack this system or you can attack the email. You can change the MX record, they end up being the same. So any DNS attack works on both of these alternatives. But if you only have an email attack and not a DNS attack, then uh, you wouldn't be able to attack this, okay? Now, there's two problems with this. That might sound like this is better, but there's, there's two reasons why it's not better. 
One is that the user usually can choose. So the CA will say, you want to do email, you want to do DNS, or you want to do what I'll show you next to the website. You, that's fine, it's your choice, okay? So the adversary, if they just have an email attack, then they'll choose the email attack, right? The, or sorry, they'll, they'll choose the email validation, okay? So as long as the, the, the person registering can choose which of the methods to use, uh, it doesn't matter if some of them are stronger or weaker, they can always choose the weakest option. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, let me uh, just write this down. Okay, uh, and then the second thing, I actually blanked on it. What was it? Okay, it'll come back to me. I, I forget, there, there was another point I was gonna make. But anyways, who cares, we'll just skip it. Um, okay, so the CNS, in the DNS record, uh, the CA goes, they look up the domain, they pull the CRS, and, the, and then they check it, they issue the certificate. Um, okay, so the user, the attacker will not choose this method if they can only attack email, uh, that's fine. Uh, if they have a DNS attack though, that they can still do it. Now there, there's a nice feature of this protocol Okay, so a, a positive of this protocol. And that goes back to the, the very first question I asked. So the whole reason we're looking at this is we're trying to figure out how does the CA decide that that's Concordia.ca's public key. And then the question I asked, the sub question is why can't users just do the same thing? Okay, the users can just do the same thing then you don't need CAs. So let's let's actually answer that question for email. Okay, so you could go to Concordia.ca for the very first time, right? And you could and Concordia will say this is my public key. There's no CAs. It's not signed. It just says here's my public key. And I say I don't know. I don't know if I believe you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an email to admin.concordia.ca, and if you can respond to that email, then I'll believe you that this is your key. It doesn't quite work because you're not quite binding that value that you send to the key, but more or less you could think of that as the protocol, okay? Now, why don't we do that? Well, it's kind of stupid for every user who goes to a website to send an email, like think of how many emails you would have to send and you know, like it just doesn't work, okay? It works for a CA because you know, once every two years they'll do this process with the website. Okay, but it's not really going to work with your computer. Even if you automate it and these emails get fired off automatically, it's just, it's a lot of extra traffic and things like that, okay? But if the, um, if Concordia says, this is my public key, go check my DNS record, you're checking it already, right? You need to know the IP address. You, you just checked it a second ago because you have my IP address, right? I, I got your message at this IP address, so obviously you, you have my DNS record. Don't worry, I put the key in the, D, in the DNS record, so just go check it. This is my key, just make sure it matches the DNS record that you've already fetched, and if the two of them match, then you know my key, okay? That's all the CA is going to do anyway. The CA is just going to do some protocol that you know is, is securely dependent on DNS anyways, right? So like the CA is actually not in a better position. The CNA can go around and check DNS records than the user can too. Right? There's, there's no difference between the CA and the user, okay? Now, the only problem with that line of reasoning is that DNS records are not encrypted, okay? Or they're not signed, that's the important thing. It's not so much the, the confidentiality doesn't matter, but the integrity matters, okay? And so you could do it this way. You could just believe keys, but if the adversary is your Wi-Fi router, right, then they're going to change the DNS record when you receive it. They're going to change the key that's in the DNS record, okay? 
the app now you might say well if the adversary can attack me doing this protocol why don't they attack the ca well the answer is the adversary would have to be on basically between the ca and the ca's dns server okay and that's true if they were sitting on that wire they could attack the protocol okay that's that's why we said that all these dns attacks work okay but it's a lot harder for the adversary to be on verisign's network than it is to be on the network that you happen to be on right um, so it's, it's more realistic that a CA and it's their job, you know, and they understand the consequences of, of looking up DNS, right? It's, it's more reasonable that they would be able to, um, that they would be more sort of diligent in checking DNS records than just your computer, which could be on any network with any adversary between you and the DNS server. And a lot of times the router tells you the DNS server to use anyway, right? I connect to Concordia. I'm not choosing the DNS. It's telling me. It says go go use this DNS server. And my computer just does it. Okay, um, so that that's the only reason why that doesn't work. But in a world where we had DNSSEC and it was turned on, then we would have signatures on the DNS record. Then it doesn't matter if the Wi-Fi is is corrupt because it can't replace uh, these these uh, signatures on the DNS records. Okay, so in a world where we have DNSSEC, we actually could just get rid of CAs and have everyone just put their key in their domain names. Uh, so that's a protocol that exists. It's called Dane. Uh, but, but because DNSSEC isn't as widely deployed as we want, we don't use it. Okay. But anyways, if we could fix the DNSSEC problem, then we could have Dane um, and, then, and then we could do it. Okay. So you don't need CAs anymore if, if you could do this. But it requires signed DNS, which is basically DNSSEC. And there, there are uh, other protocols. There's one that routes DNS over HTTPS, and there's a few alternatives. Uh, but, but, but basically, they're, they're, they're sort of like stalled in terms of deployment. The third thing that you can do that's a little bit sketchy, so not all CAs will let you do this, is you can put the key or the CRS just up on your domain at a certain known location. So for example, domain.ca slash crs.txt or whatever. And it will tell you, the CA will basically say, okay, put, put the file here, we'll go fetch it, it's kind of the same thing. They have to go to DNS. They have to get the IP address. If you could somehow get them redirected, then obviously you could redirect them to your own CRS, which has your own key. Uh, then they go over to the domain. Uh, you can assume that this happens over HTTPS. Why can't you? Well, the person's coming to you because they want a certificate, right? Now, it's possible that they're renewing a certificate. So maybe they already have a certificate, and they're just renewing it. In that case, this would go over HTTPS. But in most cases, they're coming to you for a certificate because they don't have one already. And so they, they, can't, they can't give this to you over HTTPS without a certificate. And they don't have a certificate until you sign off on the certificate, right? So you have this, this problem that you can't solve, OK? So you, you would have to assume that, um, that this is over HTTP because the site doesn't have a certificate yet. That's why they're trying to get a certificate. So then it's kind of like email too, like it's not encrypted. So if you're in the middle somewhere, then you could just change, uh, you could change what's sitting there on this file and then uh, you, can, you can change it. Okay, so, um, so DNS attacks, man in the middle attacks work. Any kind of like password, because this mail, this, uh, 
HTTPS server is probably password protected. Like, why can't I just go and upload, say, I want that file at that location? Well, there's going to be some username password on it that stops me from doing it. Um, so there's password attacks on HTTPS server, insider attacks, all that stuff. HTML server, I should say. Okay, uh, let's just draw a few lessons and we'll, we'll break. Okay, so this whole CA model, um, sometimes we call it, there's a fancy, a, a formal name for it, we call it PKI, uh, which is public key infrastructure. which is all the stuff you do just to figure out, you have a bunch of people and you want to figure out what their keys are. Okay, it sounds really simple. You just throw up a telephone book, names and keys, but like who's authoritative over that, right? So anyway, so PKI is this whole area because it's actually a hard problem to solve. Um, but basically the whole CA model, you know, it, you can attack it through basically what we'll say. If you can attack things like DNS, email, unencrypted HTML, HTTP, uh, passwords, you get the right password to the right account, et cetera. You know, any of these things that you can do, you can basically, you can subvert the entire PKI, even though it uses lots of fancy crypto. And the other thing you might draw from this is um, with the exception of EV certificates, and once again, the adversary has a choice, right? They don't, if maybe Google uses an EV certificate, but I want to attack it, I can get a DV certificate with my own key and I can serve that up. Like it makes no difference, right? So the adversary is always going to choose the weakest option. So if I can attack email, I'm going to ask for a DV certificate over email. It doesn't matter if the real Google uses an EV certificate over DNS. Doesn't, doesn't make a difference, okay? Um, but, but, but anyways, uh, the CAs, with the exception of the EV certificates, they're really not any smarter than you or I, okay? There's, there's nothing special about them where it's like, oh, we really know all the universities in Canada and we know the right people so we can figure out this key problem of whose public key it is. They don't know anything, right? All they do is they send an email to admin at concordia.ca and if they get the right response, then they're like, okay, that must be the right key, okay? So they're really not doing anything more than you or I could do. The only problem is really kind of a scalability problem. Like they'll do it once and then they'll sign the certificate so that millions of people don't have to do it again, okay? So they, they kind of solve a scalability problem, but they're, they're really, they're not actually what we say authoritative, right? They're not authoritative over what they're signing. They don't know, they don't have any special insider information that you and I uh, do not do not have, okay? Yeah, 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 they're trusted without, reason to trust them, right? So, so you might trust someone because they, they're more trustworthy somehow. But these, these people aren't more trustworthy. Like they just, they do stuff that you could do yourself, right? Yeah. So they save you time, but they don't save you trust, if you want to put it that way. So they're not authoritative over, I'll just use the term PKI since we defined it. So they have no special insider knowledge. And they're basically there for efficiency reasons. So they can do the process once. So users do not have to repeat it. So it's actually a good business to get into, right? You throw a server up and all it has to do is, you know, spit out these X values and then if the person, you know, and send some emails, 
right? And certificates could be hundreds of dollars or, or thousands in, in the case of an EV certificate. But, um, you know, it's basically just, you know, and that's why there's 600 companies that want to do this, right? Because you just throw a server up and people will pay you uh, and you can just fully automate uh, the process. Okay, uh, so let's uh, take a break. It's a little overdue. I apologize for that. Uh, but let's come back at 4.20. All right, we'll start again. Okay, so everything I showed you is basically how the CA figures out that the domain is actually uh, the right domain. Uh, and and that, that's it. So we'll, we're going to move on to a different topic now. Um, so let's say that that's happened. So the domain, you go to, to the CA, you're able to issue a certificate, you have your certificate. Um, what's next? Okay, what, yeah. Sure. So you could, yeah, so anybody can register any domain for any reason. The CA, being issued a certificate doesn't say you're a good website or a bad, it's not a, like a judgment on how good your website is. It's literally just that the server that's sitting at this domain name and this public key, they belong to the same person. That's, that's all it says. So a certificate isn't an endorsement of a website. It doesn't mean it's safe to use. It doesn't mean any of that. So that's another problem. Users sometimes have the mental model that, yeah, when I see the lock, it's a safe website. It doesn't mean it. It just means that your traffic can't be eavesdropped. And you know that that key is right, that you got the right key. Cool. Okay. Other questions about domain? validation okay okay so now we have our certificate okay so what happens is the user will uh, go to a website usually for the first time you, you sometimes will remember a certificate for a while um, and you'll say okay I, I want to talk HTTPS start TLS uh, and then the website will send back its certificate Usually as a chain, but we, we won't, we'll just obscure those details, okay? And now what the user is going to do is they're going to check the certificate. So they have to check it, okay? And it's worth thinking a little bit about what does it mean to check a certificate? Like, like what, what exactly are you checking, okay? So we, we call this certificate validation. And I'll say by client, uh, just to dis differentiate it from the CA validation. Okay, so the, the first obvious thing is, is what we've been talking about. It needs to be signed, and either it's signed by a root certificate or it's signed by some certificate that traces back to the root certificate, okay? So it's very unusual that it would be directly signed by a root CA, but it at least has to trace back. Okay. Now, let's say I own whatever, domain.com, and I go and I get a certificate. So I have a certificate for domain.com. It's real. It's legitimate. I actually own domain.com. I'm not doing anything malicious. Okay. And I see you, and you're trying to go to facebook.com, and I want to intercept your traffic. So I see you request to start HTTPS with Facebook. Facebook sends back a message, here's my certificate. And I just lift that certificate out of the pack, like out of the, the trace, and I drop my certificate instead, and it goes down to the user. So this is a certificate. It is actually signed by a CA, right? So what's, why won't the user just start using that? Because if they start using that certificate, then, the, then I can decrypt the traffic, okay? So the user will say, hey, I asked for facebook.com and you're sending me a certificate for domain.com. Those are different, 
Okay, so you have to check, it's sort of obvious, but you have to check that the certificate that you're being given actually matches the domain that you're trying to, to, uh, to visit. So the subject name is, is the fancy word for the domain name. Subject name of certificate. Matches the domain you are visiting. Okay, uh, maybe I should have done this in a slightly different order, but going back to this one, um, so we check all the signatures uh, in the certificate chain. We also have to check that all the CAs are actually CAs. So remember there was that flag that would, you could turn on or off for whether someone's a CA. So like, let's say, once again, let's say I'm the attacker, I have a certificate for domain.com, it's real, it traces back to a root certificate. Why can't I go and sign, and I, tr I wanna intercept your Facebook traffic, so let's just continue with that example. I can't drop my certificate in, because my certificate's for domain.com, and you, you're trying to visit facebook.com, okay? But then I say, oh, who cares? I'll just issue a certificate for facebook.com. So I'll issue a certificate for facebook.com, I'll put a key that I control in it, I'll sign it with the key that's in my domain.com certificate, and then I'll hand it all to you and you'll say, okay, there's this Facebook certificate, it's signed by domain.com, domain.com is signed by this CA, and this CA is signed by a root certificate that I trust, right? So the whole thing traces back, so that's, that's good, right? So what stops it? Well, what stops it is when I was given that certificate for domain.com, it's not, it, it, it's a certificate for my public key, but it doesn't authorize me to be a CA. So it doesn't authorize me to turn around and issue certificates. Uh, all I can do is prove my own public key, but I can't issue new certificates, okay? So if you look at the intermediate certificate and my certificate, they look exactly the same. They both have like a name and a key and like all the other information, but there'll be one flag that's either checked or not basically saying this is a CA certificate or this isn't a CA certificate, okay? So you, you need to check what's what we call the constraints. So that's, there's, there's other constraints, but that's the main one. Um, so CA equals true for CA certificates. Um, there's this notion of ex expiration. So certificates, when they're issued to you, they, they come with a shelf life of something like a year or two. Uh, the reason for it mainly is because uh, servers get compromised all the time. People lose their keys. And so if I issued a certificate for 50 years and then your key gets, your server gets breached, uh, then I don't want that certificate to be around for 50 years or whatever. So it's just sort of a natural kind of expiration where, where it kind of, it's sort of like damage control. Uh, it also makes money for the CAs because now you have to go back every two years or every six months and get one. So uh, when I receive a certificate, I want to make sure that it's not expired. Any certificate in the chain, uh, but emphasis on the, the, the site certificate. Now what's the harm if, if, let's say I get a certificate and it's expired, is that really dangerous? Like you can, some of these times, like if some of these checks fail, you can override them and just say, I don't care, right? If a certificate's expired, it's probably not a big deal. If, if it's a mismatch, you know, it's a certificate for a completely different website than the website that I'm visiting, that's a big deal, right? That looks like an impersonation attack. An expired certificate means that this was a valid certificate three weeks ago. Right, And so the only attack there really is just that it was breached. But if the attacker had attacked me three weeks ago, right, then I would have been like, well, the certificate's not expired and I would have done the connection anyways, okay? So expired certificates, they're, they're the most common error that you will still see when you're accessing websites over HTTPS. They're probably not a big deal because it was a valid certificate not so long ago, okay? So you know that you're at least talking to the right website if you trust this whole PKI and there's no attacks anywhere, then you know you're, you're at least talking to the right website. You have at least what was the right key 
and you just don't know if they're, it's currently their right key. Okay, so maybe they, they uh, have it, basically it, it could have got breached. That's the only kind of consideration, okay? Now, what happens if you sign up for a certificate today and you say, I want a certificate for two years and tomorrow your server is breached and you have intrusion detection or something like that, you know it, you saw it, maybe you see someone out in the wild that's using your key uh, to impersonate your website. So you're 100% sure that it's breached. Do you have to wait two years for your certificate to expire? Isn't there anything that you can do about it now? Can you cancel it? Yeah. So could you cancel a certificate? No. Okay, so there's a process called revocation or revoking. Uh, but think about it, like how, how does, let's say I'm, I buy a brand new computer, I connect to concordia.ca, the adversary is there, they're feeding me a correct certificate, right? How am I going to learn that that's revoked, okay? Like how, how is it that, like if I connect to the real website, they'll be like, oh, don't trust that key anymore. Right? But if on my first connection I connect to the adversary and the adversary has a right key and it's all signed and everything, right? it's really hard for me to, to, to figure out that that's revoked. Okay? So revocation, uh, we'll, we'll look at how it works, but it's, it's not a great uh, protocol. Okay. Now, these aren't all the checks. There's lots of little details that you need to check. These are the checks that I'm going to emphasize because there's problems about basically all five of them. Okay? Okay, so the difference is that the expiration date will be in the certificate itself. It will be signed by the CA. You can't change it because it's locked in. So when I get a certificate from a website, the expiration date is part of the package that I receive, okay? Revocation, though, that's something that happens outside of the certificate, right? It's not in the certificate itself. Uh, and so I have to have some outside information that tells me that it's revoked. So expiration is very easy to enforce. The user can make an easy decision about expiration because it's, it's right there. But revocation is going to be way harder because they have to figure out, they have to learn from someone else that it's revoked or not. Okay, let's put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. So we'll talk about revocation and then we'll, we'll yeah. But, but basically you shouldn't trust, it's not like an expert, if you see an expired certificate, you're like, oh, it's probably okay. But a revoked certificate, no. If you know that it's revoked, there's a reason that it's revoked. So then there's that, that's the false positive. So yeah, that just wait, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, Okay, so there, basically there's been issues with all of these, so that's why they're here, and I'll just tell you some stories about what went wrong in, in these different cases. Okay, so let's... I'll tell you a story about two. Uh, so two was domain mismatch. So this is probably the highest profile uh, error. And the fact that it happened in domain mismatch is actually, you'll see it's just, it sort of happened to happen there, but it could have happened at any of these checks. It's kind of a, a general story. Um, Okay, so this was a, a big deal. Uh, it was a bug. Uh, it was called go to fail. I uh, don't have a date for it. Maybe someone that has a computer or something can look it up and tell me. Um, okay, so this was a bug. It was software implementation error. Uh, so it wasn't, it's not in the protocol itself, it's in the implementation. And it's specifically in the implementation of the uh, the client check here. So I have a computer, my browser, or my operating system is doing this list of checks for me, okay? There's some software there that's doing it. What that software is will depend on my operating system. So if it's from Microsoft, it will be one thing. If it's Unix, it will be a different thing. And if it's Apple, uh, it will be something called S-Tunnel. Uh, 
and it was an implementation error. It's kind of interesting, so I'll show you the code, even though this isn't really a coding course. So the way the library worked is it had a bunch of checks that it wanted to do. So basically, it was walking through a list kind of like this, but probably more detailed in terms of a bunch of checks. And so the code was just like, OK, go check this thing, and there was a subroutine for it. And then you would get back either it passed or it failed. OK? And if it failed, you would jump to the end. and like Because once one thing fails, you know the whole thing fails. OK? So you, you don't have to ch keep checking other stuff. So once it fails, you just jump to the end of the code, and then you return that it failed. Uh, and if it doesn't fail, then you keep going. You keep going through the checks. OK? So that's what they want to implement, basically check, did it fail or not, either proceed or go to the end. Check, did it fail or not, either proceed or go to the end. OK? And the way the code worked, like vastly simplified, is you had a variable, we'll call it check, and it was a Boolean, it was either 0 or 1. And 0 meant there was no error or it passed. So this is slightly unintuitive because normally you would think 1 would be the check, the true condition, but, but anyways, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, and then 1 would be that there, there's an error, and so you should fail. Okay, so you have an if statement, and you're like, I'm going to check some condition, and I won't write out the conditions, but let's just pretend it's a subroutine or something like that, and uh, it's going to return 0 or 1, depending on whether there's an error or not. And if there's no error, okay, uh, then I want to go on to the next check. If there is an error, so if error or sorry, if uh, check equals one, or I'll, I'll put it, I can't remember if it makes a difference or not. I'll say check not equal to zero. Uh, then what you want to do is you want to fail. And so the way they implemented it, and the, the name comes from the fact that they uh, use what's called a go-to. So a go-to uh, just says, basically, there's some location later in the code, you mark it as fail, and you're just going to jump down. To that location. So I'll, I'll show you that location in a second. Um, so anyways, they had like, I don't know, a hundred of these checks, right? It's complicated code. You're checking a lot of things. Um, so, so you have a whole bunch of them. I'll just put in three so that we can kind of see it all on one slide. OK, so you have condition one, condition two, condition three. And then you have fail at the end. And what fail does is it returns to the calling code basically what's sitting inside of check. Okay. OK, so let's say there's no error. If there's no error, then check always stays at 0. You skip over the go to fail. You check the next condition. It's still at 0. You skip. Uh, it's still at zero, you skip, then you return zero, which says that there was no error. Okay? So if we trace through this code, it's fine. Uh, if there is an error, let's say the error happens here, then this becomes uh, check is no longer equal to zero, it's a one. Then you go to fail, and then you return a one instead of a zero. Okay? So basically, if there's no error in any condition, it will always return a zero, and if there is an error, then it will uh, return a one. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with this code. You might be squinting at it thinking, okay, what's, what's the problem with it? No, this code is fine. Okay. The problem with Apple's code is it didn't look like this. It looked very, very similar, but we don't know why. It could have been maybe a copy-paste error, uh, or it could be a malicious backdoor. We're not sure. But what happened is that there was a repeated line. So it looked like this. Okay. So somebody accidentally or not so accidentally had go to fail twice instead of once in one of these conditions. OK, so what happens? So let's think about, let's say that there, there's no error. OK, so we go to condition one. If there's an error, we go to fail and we return that there has been an error. If there's no error, we proceed. OK, so the next line of code we'll check is condition two. OK, now if there is an error, we're going to go to fail. We'll return 
the error. Okay, what if there's no error? So we're at condition two, there's no error. So this is not true. Check is equal to zero. Okay, what, what do we do? What's the next line of code that we execute? Okay, so we, are we going to execute this line of code, go to fail? We're going to skip over it because it's in the if. Okay, what about this line of code? It's also indented. Is it part of the if or not? Okay, so it depends on the programming language, but this we're going to assume that this is a programming language where it's not. If I did this, whoops. Okay. If I did this and I had those curly brackets on all the conditions, then doesn't matter. Okay, this code is as good as the code before. But without the curly brackets, what is how do you interpret what's what's under this if condition? It's only the next line. That's it, okay? So if there's no error here, then I'm going to go to fail, okay? And I will always go to fail, okay? I, I might go earlier because there is an error, but if I make it this far, then I'm always going to go down here, okay? So I'm going to hit this line of code, and then I'm going to go down to here. It's forcing the fail, yeah. It's forcing the jump, we'll say. Okay, now it's going down here with check equal to zero. Okay, so it's always going to return check equal zero, which basically says that there, there was no error. Okay. Now, what happens at condition three here? Do I ever reach it? Is there any way that I could possibly reach it? No, I can't. It's unreachable code. Okay. What if condition three is important? Right? Like, what if it's checking something like, hey, you know, I just got a certificate when I was going to Facebook.com. I better check that this certificate's actually for Facebook.com and not for attacker.com. Right? That's a pretty important check. What if that was condition three? What would happen? Skip over it. Okay. And what would I return? I would return, oh, I checked the certificate out. I checked, you know, all 50 things I was supposed to check, and there was no errors. Okay? So that's exactly what happened. Uh, so the code here was checking. Part of the code that got skipped uh, was, so this is unreachable. And the, the sort of easiest way of attacking it was it checked conditions like uh, whether the domain matched. Exactly, exactly. So as soon as I see a user and they're on Apple, is there any way I could know they're on Apple? Probably, like there's ways of asking like the browser and things and like the traffic from Safari looks a little different. If they're on Safari, maybe they're running Safari on Windows. It's, but anyways, I, I could make a pretty good educated guess of their operating system. So I just sit back and if I see an Apple user, then all I do is I get some certificate that is signed. It is a real certificate. It's just not for the website that they're trying to visit. And I just drop it in, right? So if they want to visit Facebook, that's fine. I drop in my attacker.com certificate. And now they use that public key as if it's Facebook's public key, okay? So they start encrypting their traffic for Facebook, but it's under this key. And I'm sitting in the middle, so I just decrypt it. Then I can forward it to Facebook. And when Facebook comes back, you know, I can decrypt it and re-encrypt it under my my key that I have within the tunnel that I have that ends with me. And, you know, I can just sit there and relay it. And of course I can record all the information in between. Okay. So anyway, this was like, uh, like, like mainstream news kind of error uh, when it occurred. Uh, so you could pick up like CBC or something and everyone was talking about it. And of course, Apple like quickly pushed out updates and things like that. And everyone had to update like urgent, like don't, don't skip this update. It's really important. And so eventually it was, um, it, was, uh, uh, it was fixed. Now, another interesting thing I'll, I'll just mention that's kind of part of the, si the story is how, how could you avoid this? So obviously you can write better code, but you, know, you, you can tell that to everyone. Go write better code, go write better code. Everyone's like, yeah, we'll write better code, but like, 
things like this happen, okay? It's very small, it's just a single line of code, right? Um, so, so what else could we do? So lots of people came out and they said, hey, you know what? We have a static analysis tool, okay? You just put your source code in and it will spit out vulnerabilities. And because this is unreachable, that's a pretty easy to identify. Like if you have a bunch of 50 lines of code sitting there and there's no possible way of reaching it, I can flag that for you and say that, I can't say that you made a mistake, but I could say something seems weird here, right? You have all this code and there's no way of reaching it. Um, so all the people came out and then they would take S tunnel because it was open source. Not all of Apple stuff is, but this library was. And they would say, oh, when I put it through my tool, I see that, you know, that there is this error, okay? The implication being that everyone should use these tools. Now, what they don't tell you, you have to take this with a grain of salt, is that these tools will also find, you know, a thousand other quote unquote errors that aren't actually errors, okay? So yes, it will find this error, it will flag it, but it's going to give you a thousand other false flags that aren't actual errors. And then you as the human reviewer, you have to go through and say, okay, is this actually an error or is it just a false positive of the software, okay? So static analysis, I'm not saying you shouldn't use it, okay? It's, it's better than not using it at all, but at the same time, it's not, just because a static analysis tool finds this, this error, that doesn't mean that it, that it was easy to find the error, okay? Because they might have found lots of other things that weren't errors, okay? So you have to sort through them, okay? So just remember, that these tools have, they have false positives as well. And, and usually these tools are like, when you pick up an academic paper, it doesn't look that big. They're like, oh, the false positives are under 5% or something like that, right? But 5% is a lot, right? That's like, you know, one in 20 lines of code, right? Or even if it's 99% precise, Right, or the false positive rate is 1%. That's one out of 100. Say it's by line, it, like you can think about what it means, what they're counting, but let's say they're counting lines of code. One in 100 lines of code, that's quite a bit to look through, right? You have 1,000 lines of code, then, then you have 10 flags or whatever, right? And you have to like figure out what's, what's generating them. Um, the, the other thing that they weren't doing that they really got slammed for, all the security people who really knew what they're talking about is they said, well, you should have done unit testing. Okay, so what is unit testing? It means, hey, just take a certificate that's not for the right domain and try and throw it at the library and see what happens, right? Like you should have like a bunch of tests where you do all the things that it's, not, you know, it's supposed to catch. Like someone sat down and they wrote the code that says, check whether the domain is the same in the certificate and as of the website. So at the same time that they're writing those lines of code, they should also be designing a test that basically throws a bad certificate at the library, right? And then at the end of the day, they can check it. And if they had done that test, they would have seen, oh, this is accepting certificates that are wrong, right? And so, um, so your unit test should at least match the lines of code. And then you can go even further. You can do like fuzzing where you like throw random stuff at it and just see how the library behaves and things like that. But you don't even have to go to that level of sophistication. You can just, you know, test, basically test what, what the code is supposed to be doing. So try every different kind of fake certificate, you know, an expired certificate, a revoked certificate, a domain mismatch, CA flag not turned on, whatever. Try, try all of them, have, you know, have a thousand fake certificates, just throw them at the library, see what it happens. And if it accepts something that it shouldn't, then you can investigate further and figure out what, what the problem is. So academics did this years later. So they now you can get like lots of, a big corpus of fake certificates that are wrong in all sorts of weird ways. Some of them come down to like weird parsing issues or special characters and uh, you know, a lot of them are kind of machine generated through fuzzing techniques and things like that. So you can, you can throw them once you, someone comes out with a brand new library, you can throw, uh, you know, all these certificates at it and see how it behaves. Uh, okay, let's talk about three. So three was the uh, basic, what we call basic constraints. CA equals true or CA equals false.
Okay, so if I go and look at Concordia CA certificate, I see it was signed by Global Sign. If I go into the certificate itself, uh, there will be a field called uh, basic constraints, a set of fields. And then there's this thing CA yes. And so that basically says that this certificate, the global sign certificate, is a CA, so they're allowed to issue it. They are allowed to issue certificates down the chain. Okay? Now when Concordia gets their, their certificate, they shouldn't be a CA. Okay? So I'll find the basic constraints, and then I have certificate authority equals no. Okay? So that's, that's basically the only difference. So it's, it's literally one bit of information, a zero or one, that is the difference between being a CA and a site certificate or a LEAF certificate uh, in the chain. And so uh, someone in the early days of Windows, uh, someone just, they decided, hey, for fun, let's just try and issue, like, we'll just go through the process of issuing uh, certificates from a site certificate as opposed to a CA certificate. And obviously they're not valid for this reason, but let's just do it anyways and see what happens. Okay. So they tried it and Windows would accept those certificates. Okay. So they weren't checking that, or at least it wasn't being reached, uh, that check, but most likely that they just, they just weren't checking the field. Okay. Um, so these, I don't have a date for you, uh, but basically in early in Windows history, uh, it, this was not checked. And so what that means is you could use any site, I, I call them site certificates, kind of like a leaf certificate, as if you were a CA. Okay. And then everyone said, oh, that's stupid. You know, Microsoft, they're so dumb. It was in the 90s. You know, who cares? Like, uh, you know, they should have known better. But, you know, SSL, it was new. And we learned our lesson. So, like, we'll never repeat this mistake. It, you know, it happened once in history, and, and that's fine. Okay? Then the new iPhone came out. Apple said, oh, we have this new product called an iPhone. And guess what? You try this certificates, and it would pass. Uh, with the iPhone, because the iPhone had a new operating system. New operating system means new SSL library, and new SSL library means that someone had to re-implement it, and they didn't check again. And the iPhone, I don't, I don't have exact dates. I'm going to say it was 20 years later, probably. It might have been 10 or something like that. But like 20 years went by. Everyone knew about it. Uh, what Windows had done and how dumb Microsoft had been, and then they just went and did the same thing. Then everyone said, oh, Apple, dumb, whatever, iPhone. It will never happen again. It's happened twice, right? It's never going to happen again. And then recently, there have been, I don't have brand names, but there's been a bunch of IoT devices. Uh, so IoT devices are internet-connected devices. They often have a custom operating system, which means a brand new SSL stack, which means someone has to re-implement all these checks. And guess what? Uh, they make the same mistake. Okay. In another 10 years, we'll have smart cars or something, I don't know, drones or something like that, and they're going to they're gonna make this mistake too. Okay. So the first time you get a new internet-connected device, try this attack out and, and see if it works. Okay, another story about uh, two. Two was uh, the mismatched domain. Sorry, scrolling messes up when I share my screen or record my screen. Okay, uh, so this is the main mismatches again. Okay. 
Okay, so this happened in, uh, it was observed in Syria. And there's a story on why it was observed and why it was observed at the time that it was observed, but we'll, we'll skip over that in a second. Uh, and so what would happen, this is basically what you saw. Uh, a user would go to some website like facebook.com. This was one that it, it would work for. And Facebook would respond with its certificate. Valid Facebook certificate for facebook.com. Okay? There was an adversary in the middle. We're not sure who. And what the adversary did is they just dropped in they, did, they didn't have a Facebook certificate, okay? And they weren't able to twist the arm of a CA or anything like that, so they couldn't get it. So they did like probably the stupidest attack that you could do that actually is a genius attack when you, when you stop and think about it. They, just, they did actually what GoToFail wasn't catching is they just dropped in any old certificate, okay? So they replaced it with a certificate that had nothing to do with Facebook.com, okay? Uh, it was... If you looked at the details of the certificate, it was uh, what we call self-signed, meaning it wasn't even signed by CA. It was just signed by themselves as if they were a CA. Uh, the, the name, you have to put a name in. Uh, so they put Syrian Telecom. But I want to emphasize that anybody anywhere in the world could make a certificate that says anything. If it's self-signed, it doesn't mean anything, right? So. This, this could be anybody in the world uh, that, that puts any string in here. It doesn't matter. But it's basically just a completely untrusted certificate. Okay. Now, this did happen. Uh, I don't have a date. Let's, once again, I'll, I'll say about 15 years ago, maybe less. Um, so the, the internet, the whole way that we handle SSL and things like that is different now. So it doesn't, it's not going to, this attack won't work today. Okay, but if we roll back time to 15 years ago, this is the attack. What do you think happens? Okay, so the user is going to Facebook.com, and they get some completely unexpected certificate for some other website. Okay, so the browser is going to go and they're going to check it, and there's no go-to fail errors or anything like that. So the, the 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 browser checks it and they notice that this error is there. Okay, so they say, oh, these domains don't match. There's an error. Now what? What's the browser going to do? Okay, so it could not connect. It could just drop the connection. That would be option one. Okay, it could try and make an educated decision on the user's behalf. It could ask the user what the user wants to do. Okay, and so back in the day, uh, the answer is it would ask the user what they wanted to do. So it basically say, hey, there's a certificate, mismatched domains, what do you want to do? Okay, the browser didn't want to decide for you. It just would let the user decide. Okay. So it would display a warning. Now we'll study this. We'll talk about usability later in this course. Um, but basically what it would do is it would... Uh, it would try and describe the error to the user, right? So it might say, oh, there's a mismatched domain, okay? Now imagine you're just a normal everyday user, not, you know, you're not used to computers. Does, does mismatched domain, does that sound, what does that mean to you, right? You probably have no idea, right? It's just garbly goop, it's jargon, okay? That's, that's, so we call it jargon. So there's some jargon about mismatched domains or whatever. Exactly. So then, and then after all this, it explains the error to you in a way that you cannot understand. It just sounds like a bunch of technical nonsense. And then it says, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to proceed? Or do you want to like cancel? Now the user, they're trying to go to Facebook. They get this error. They have no idea what it means. They can press one button and they'll go to Facebook. What are they going to do? They're going to press the button, right? Okay, 
So most users will press. There was an actual user study where they brought up people into the lab and they they set up this whole thing, and uh, I forget what it was, but it's something like like ninety percent or more. Press the button. Okay. Then what happens? Are you are you dropped on a scary hacker looking website? No, you go to Facebook. Is there a lock? Well, yeah, so you might, the browser may or may not, but generally, I think, I, I don't recall exactly, but I think they probably showed you the lock. You told it to proceed anyways, right? So as far as it's concerned, it's not a problem for you, right? And anyways, it's the real Facebook site. You can log in, your real profile will show up, right? The only difference is that there's somebody that's listening to it and they grabbed your password as it went across or they grabbed your cookie and now they're logged into you as you and they can do whatever they want. Uh, with it, okay? So it's actually a very dangerous attack, but it doesn't feel dangerous, right? You just click one button and then your experience is just, like you don't even remember that you clicked it and there's no indication uh, that, that something went wrong. Yeah, so there's all sorts of attacks you could do once you have access as the attacker. And the user could always click on the certificate. That would be the one thing that they could do, but no one clicks on certificates, right? Like when's the last time you went to a website and, I mean, I did it for the sake of the class, but when's the last time you were just like, oh, I wonder who signed this and who the domain name is, right? Like no, one, no one's doing that, right? Um, okay, so, so there's no indication. Now, like I said, this was you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, Actually, I have it in my notes that it was 20 years ago, so let me put that. And so browser said, okay, this, this can't happen. Uh, we, we need to fix this. And so uh, they did a bunch of things, uh, and Chrome was probably the most responsive, and then other browsers sort of copied what Chrome did. Um, so not just necessarily with this warning, but with all warnings, they really try to improve the language of the warning, make it accessible, just tell you directly what's happening. Like, like um, this website might not be the real Facebook. It might be a hacker instead, right? Like that's, that's basically the bottom line, right? And that's a much more readable like kind of answer. So they improved warnings and errors uh, wording. Um, they, for, for very serious errors, they would just, they wouldn't let you click through, okay? So you, you just can't click through anymore. Um, so they, and in some cases you can still click through but they kind of put a bunch of friction. Like, like it's not just as easy as like, do you want to proceed, yes or no? Uh, you have to like click more information. And then in more information, you have to click. I just know for Safari, like if you go to a website that's expired with Safari, it will give you the warning message and then you can click more information. Then if you click on more information, it will say, okay, do you want to like, do you want to proceed anyways? And then you click on it and then it opens up Keychain and it's like, okay, you need to type in your admin password saying that you're, you're going to authorize this certificate, and then you do all of that, and then eventually you can you can go to the website. Okay, um, so either they just won't let you click through. That's an expired certificate. So I said that's not like the most dangerous one. If it's a mismatched domain, it probably I haven't tried it, but I imagine it wouldn't even let you click through. Um, so it either won't let you click through, or it's it's a lot harder to click through. Okay, and last I'll tell you a story about another mismatched domain story. Okay, so this one's kind of weird. 
Uh, but I just wanted to include it. These are pretty simple. Like this is probably the simplest attack that you could do. So, so you have to worry about all the really simple attacks. And then this stuff can get like arbitrarily complex. Um, so this is an example of a, a sort of very complicated attack. It, some people say it never actually worked in real life and others say it, it worked specifically against this CA and Netscape Navigator. Uh, it's another like old uh, kind of attack. Um, but it, it seemed to have worked on early version of Netscape. But it's just a good example of the kinds of things that you have to worry about. It goes far beyond the list that we, um, that we came up with. OK, so this is the essence of it. Um, so you go to a CA, and you request a certificate for a domain. And they say, OK, what's your domain? And I say, OK, my domain is I'm google.com null character dot Jeremy Clark dot com. Okay, so I stick some weird special character in my domain request, and that's fine. Okay, uh, so I can do that. I can submit any Unicode, and whether the software accepts it, that that's a different story. But I can at least try. Okay, now if you're writing the software for the CA, you're going to pull this domain out, and you're going to say, okay, I need to send an email to a min at google.com nullcharacter.jeremyclark.com. And so let me get that email ready. Now, when you parse that string, what happens? Okay, you hit that null character, it's weird. It's not a legal character. So what are you going to do about it? Okay, I'll, I heard a few things, but I didn't quite catch it all. There's basically two things that you can do, uh, or three, I guess. You could just reject it completely. You could skip the character. Or if your library is written in C, how do you know the end of a string? So if it's in Java, you're just like, oh, this is a string. Maybe this is how long it is. I, f I forget if they pack that at the start. And you sort of you pull that many bytes, and then that's it. Okay. Uh, if you're written in C and you're like, here's a string. String can be any length. How do you know you've reached the end of this string? Well, they use the null character. It's a special symbol. Okay. So if the library is written in C, it might misinterpret this as, oh, the string is over. I just hit the null character. Okay. And so we call that a null terminated string. So we terminate the string. Okay. Now. If everybody in the world re like just rejects this string, there's no problem. If everyone in the world says, let's just skip over the character, there's no problem. If everyone in the world says, let's treat this as a null terminated string, there's no problem. Okay, So it doesn't matter which of these three you do. But what, where there is a problem is when some of the world looks at this string and they say, let's skip the character, and other parts of the world says, no, 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 let's treat it as a null terminated. Okay? So if you have inconsistencies, two people look at the same string and they see different things, then you could have a problem. Okay? And different systems are implemented in different languages, running on different operating systems. This type of error happens a lot. Okay? If you don't spend a lot of time parsing your strings consistently, you're going to end up with a bunch of different parsers that parse it differently. Okay? So the, the problem here basically is, let's say that the CA drops null, and the user's browser who receives the certificate, they do uh, null termination. In this case, the CA is going to say, oh, you're asking for Google dot com dot jeremy clark dot com that's kind of a weird domain but anyways that's fine we'll just you basically you 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 know you want a certificate for jeremy clark dot com that's a top level domain so we're going to send you an email at admin at jeremy clark blah 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 
and then I can get that email. It, it, I actually own Jeremy Clark domain, and that's no problem. So they sign off on the certificate. We have to assume that they signed the raw certificate, so they're signing it with the null character. Then when I show it to a user, and the user's browser does null termination, they'll say, oh, this is a certificate for google.com null character. Oh, I, I, I have to stop here. Okay, so it, it, oh, it's a certificate for google.com. Okay, no problem. All right, uh, so what I can do is I can drop this certificate in for anyone visiting google.com, and then I can repeat it for whatever domain I want. And you can even ask for like what are called wildcard certificates. So you could put like star.jeremyclark.com and you could somehow, uh, or star.com. Now they won't actually give you a wildcard certificate for all of .com. It's too dangerous, but, but anyways, uh, at least you can, uh, you can attack specific domains and then there's ways to attack more than one domain using this attack. Okay, so anyway, that's the kind of weird stuff that you have to worry about. All right, we're uh, completely out of time. Uh, so that's good. No class next week. Uh, remember that. And so I'll see you in two weeks.